This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. His compassion fail not. It is new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to him, trust in him, and he will do it. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his predetermined plan. I want to welcome um, everyone once again um, to our first uh, Sunday of the month, communion um, service, and we are uh, going to have a memorial service today uh, commemorating the work of our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. If you're joining us for the first time uh, for uh, the last six months or so, uh, we have been looking at the 39 grace uh, uh, a blessing or 39 eternal works of God that happens the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. So every communion Sunday, we look at a couple or sometime another, only one uh, eternal work. And this communion Sunday, we are at number 17. We're at blessing 17 in the 39 eternal works of God at salvation. Uh, keep in mind the whole principle of grace. As you know, uh, this is grace uh, Bible ministry. Uh, we are a ministry that believe that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Jesus Christ have already done all the work and the only thing left for us to do is simply put our faith in the finished work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We also wish uh, in our dealing with people to reflect uh, that same grace that was shown to us. Grace is kindness shown to those who don't deserve it. It is all that God is free to do for us because of what Christ has already done. And so we here at Grace Bible wish to reflect God's grace uh, in everything we do from uh, giving to worship and uh, to allowing you the freedom to live your own spiritual life unto God. So that means that I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to uh, get in your business or anything like that. What you do in your private uh, life is between uh, you and God, and that is a grace principle. Uh, grace is when you allow people uh, to live their own spiritual life as unto the Lord. Uh, uh, but we are a grace uh, um, church. And, and remember, these eternal words are eternal. In other words, you can't lose it. Once you receive it, you cannot lose these eternal words. And these words happen at salvation. You cannot lose it. You did nothing to earn it. So it makes sense that if we did not do anything or could not do anything to earn these blessings, then how can you do anything to lose it? If you did nothing to earn it, you can't do anything to lose it. They are eternal works. In other words, God don't take these blessings back from you when you screw up or when you mess up. He don't because they were not given as a result of your work or your performance Anyway, now that don't mean that we as believers uh, uh, should not perform. That don't mean that we should uh, continue to sin so that God can continue to be gracious to us. Well, you try. You got to get a divine butt with it. And, 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 and I have tried it uh, in my past lifestyle. When I understood the grace of God, I thought that, oh, oh, if I'm saved by grace, if I receive all the blessing by grace, then I might as well just have a ball and just, have a great time. I'm going to heaven anyway. Well, you try. Now, how you arrive is a different story. <laughs> how you arrive at heaven is a different story. You may arrive in heaven living a miserable life uh, or experiencing the discipline of God because we take grace for granted. Actually, grace should motivate us. Grace should motivate us to actually want to obey God out of love because we realize that, man, he did all that for me. He gave me all those blessings and I didn't deserve it. And it was free. I didn't have to pay for it. I didn't have to perform. I had. I didn't have to do any flips. I didn't have to stop sinning. I didn't have to do anything. But all I did was receive it by faith. That should motivate you to say, you know what? If you don't do another thing for me, you have already done enough already. What do you want me to do? I want to be obedient out of love. 
And so today we're going to look at the 17th blessing. That 17th blessing is the believer is a priest unto God. The believer is a priest unto God. He is a holy priest and he is a royal priest. Now that is a blessing. See, the priesthood of the believer in Jesus Christ. What is a priesthood? I want to first uh, uh, make it very simple uh, for the kids and uh, for those uh, believer that may not understand this concept, but what is the is priesthood so that you can appreciate this blessing of being a priest? A priesthood is a order of humans who represent themselves or others in the human race before God. The qualification to serve as a priest in the Old Testament, the priest had to be a male, but also the priest had to be a male without any defect or observable flaw. And what was expected from the priest once he was appointed was to stand between God and the people as their representative. The priest is to present sacrifices for sin. He is to present gifts to God. Now there were four categories of priests in the Bible or this priesthood. The Bible revealed four categories of priesthood ordained by God. The first priesthood, you had the patriarchal uh, priesthood with, from Adam to Moses. You had the uh, Melchizedek uh, priesthood. You had the Levitical priesthood. And then you had the church A royal priesthood. Now I want to briefly look at each of these priesthoods so that you can better understand. And by the way, it will help you understand the Bible a little better as well. The patriarchal uh, priesthood, priesthood from Adam to Moses was when the father represented the entire family before God. Men like Adam, like Noah, like Job, like Abraham, like Isaac, like Jacob and Moses were patriotic priests. If you go to Genesis 8.20, we see an example with Noah where the father represent his family before God. Genesis 8, verse 20, the father represent his family before God. And we see Nor is an example of this priesthood. In the first service, we always get volunteers to read. Can we get a volunteer to read verse 20? Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every sweet animal and every sweet bird. The Lord smelled the food and aroma, and the Lord said to him, I will never again curse the ground on the small man, for the intent of man by his evil from him. I will never again strike every living creature that I have done. While the earth remains, she time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not be. Amen. Thank you. So here we see uh, Nor function as a father priest. He is uh, uh, offering sacrifices uh, to God on behalf of his, his family. And then you go to Job 1, 5. Job was a, another example of a father priest. Job was another example of a father priest. Can I get another volunteer? Uh, verse 5, Job 1, verse 5. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he, thank you, thank you. So here we see Job uh, function as a father representative of his family. And then you go to uh, Genesis 13, 18, we have Abraham function as a father priest. 13, 18. Where 
Abrams was the channel that went to the great feet of Hammer. The Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Okay, so here we see uh, Abraham, father priest, and then we have Isaac, Genesis 2. I'm sorry, uh, Genesis uh, 22, I believe. I, I wrote this down. <laughs> It ain't Genesis 2. Genesis uh, 23, I believe. 24 and 25. No, uh, I'm sorry. 26. 26, 24, and 25. Okay, and then we have Jacob in uh, Genesis 35, verse 1 and 2. Okay, so here, these verses we just looked at gives us the concept of the father functioning as the family priesthood, where the, he represented uh, himself, but he also represented his family before God. The father priest revealed the truth of God's word. The father priest built an altar for sacrifices, and the father priest offered sacrifice for himself, but also his household. And then we have Melchizedek priesthood. In the times of Israel in the Old Testament, there was a king uh, and priest of Jerusalem, of Salem, also uh, uh, Jerusalem, which another name for Jerusalem then was Salem, who represented the nation before God. And we, we don't have to go there, but Genesis 14, 18 through 20, we have the uh, Melchizedek uh, priesthood. Uh, Melchizedek did not have uh, descendants. His order or position was not according to physical birth. He was without father, without mother, without genealogy. Um, he had no beginning of days that anybody know, nor end of life. He was made like the son of God, remaining a priest uh, forever. Now this man, Melchizedek, uh, set a par pattern for the uh, future priesthood in the church age. But he also was a type of Jesus Christ's humanity. Now, his priesthood was superior than the father priesthood. And Abraham recognized that when he gave, offered him tithing. And then three, we have the Levitical priesthood. Most of you, when you thought think of priests, you always thought of the Levitical priesthood, which was instituted when the Mosaic law was instituted after the, uh, the Egyptian captivity, God instituted and authorized the Levitical priesthood. Now, the Levitical priesthood began with Aaron, Moses' brother, who was from the tribe of Levi. Now, this priesthood was carried on by uh, Aaron's natural son. But if Aaron's, Aaron's natural son had any defect, they were disqualified from serving in the tabernacle or the temple. In this priesthood, it was commissioned by God. These priests were separated unto God, and they were allowed to come near God. The priesthood taught the law. The priesthood offered sacrifice. The priesthood maintained the tabernacle in the temple. The priesthood served in the holy place. The priesthood ceremonially uh, inspected unclean 
persons. They collect the taxes from the people. They also serve as judges when there were controversies. The Levitical priesthood represented the nation of Israel before God. This priesthood was from Aaron, 1444 BC to the destruction of the temple in AD 30. However, in AD 33, Jesus Christ's work was completed. And as a result, and the church age was brought in. And as a result, the uh, priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, had came to an end at AD 33 with the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, the Levitical priesthood will be brought back in the millennium uh, when Christ returned to reign over a restored Israel. It will be reactivated, but not as a means to salvation, but as a memorial of the cross and what Christ have already accomplished. And then lastly, we have four, the New Testament or the church aid priesthood of the royal priest. Now here's where you and I come in at. After the finished work of Christ, the church age came about in AD 33. And through Christ's work, a universal priesthood was activated. The universal priesthood or royal priesthood is the body of believers in Jesus Christ who represent themselves before God. Go to 1 Peter 2, verse 5 and 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 5 and 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 5 and 9. So every believer from Pentecost to today is a royal priest. And remember, a priest had to be holy. He had to be without defect. And the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, God gives you as a gift the righteousness of Christ. He clothed you in the righteousness of Christ. Somebody, 1 Peter 2, verse 5 and 9. Amen. So here, the believer, the church aid believer, is said to be a raw priest, a holy priesthood. This is every believer, every person in this room who is a believer is a raw priest. And he is to represent, we are to represent ourselves before God. What made us a priest was our union with Christ. The moment we believed in Jesus Christ, God placed Jesus Christ is the high priest. He represented us before God. He came and became a man for us, and he gave his life to satisfy the righteousness and the justice of God. He bare our punishment. He represented us before God, and now he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he is a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Christ became humanity to fulfill his priestly function and represent man before God. He offered himself, what? Holy, innocent, without sin, undefiled. And he separated and he was separated from sinner. And as a result, he became the substitutionary sacrifice for the sins of the human race. Go to Hebrews 7, verse... Yeah, read the next one. Read the next one, sorry. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. We can't miss that verse. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go now to Hebrews 7, verse 26 and 27. Anybody? Hebrews 7, verse 26 and 27. Such a high priest be thirty, one who is holy, blameless, pure, and set apart from sinners, sculpted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. Amen. Go ahead, see. 
Next verse. He sacrificed for their sin once, once for all when he offered himself. Amen. So here we see our Lord Jesus Christ is the great high priest. He offered himself, though, for our sin as a substitutionary sacrifice, though he himself was innocent. And he's now seated at the right hand of God the Father in the heavenly throne room. He is uh, 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 making intersection right now on the behalf of all those who draw near to God through him. See, I don't have to go to a human man uh, uh, to 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 uh, uh, be able to come near to God. Jesus Christ is my high priest and he's seated in the heavenly throne room. And every time I, in the privacy of my own soul, confess my sin, I have a high priest sitting at the right hand of the Father and probably, he probably reach over there and say, Father, look at the, the holes in my hands. <laughs> and the Father said, on the basis of your work, he is forgiven. And so Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And I don't have to go to a man to intercede or draw uh, to be able to draw near to God. I have a great, great high priest, Jesus Christ. We as a church age believer are called to function in our priesthood. In other words, the, the Levitical priesthood minister, ministrant was a shadow of Christ. The royal priest now serves in the realities of the fulfilled Christ. In other words, Christ have already done the work. Whereas when the Levitical priests were serving, everything that they did pointed to Christ, but now we are priests and we look back to what Christ have already done. And as a royal priest, we, don't, we do not offer sacrifices. Uh, we, we do not offer sacrifices and gifts for sin because Christ has once and for all sacrificed at the cross. It is complete. And you can read on your own time, Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10, what brings that out. The only ritual that is mandated by us, I mean, the only ritual that is mandated in Scripture for the priesthood is of what we're about to observe today, and that is communion. And communion is remembering our great high priest who gave himself as a substitute on the cross so that we all can come near to God in the privacy of our own soul and receive forgiveness of our sin. See, royal priest is the office of every church age believer. Upon your entry into God's family by faith alone in Christ, you were granted the commission and the privilege of representing yourself before God the Father personally. The Vilica priesthood was based on physical birth and physical attribute. But the qualification for a priest in the church age is simple. Spiritual birth. You must be born again. And that happens the moment you believe in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.26 say you all are children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's the only thing that is required to draw near to God uh, in faith, receiving forgiveness of your sin personally, is simply tell God that I am believing in your son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 12 say to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become his children. So the only requirement to be a believer priest, to represent yourself before God, to come near God and to enter God's family is simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the moment you believe you're baptized into Christ by means of his spirit and you're placed in union with the great high priest. You are part of the royal family of God and you are a kingdom of priests. Every believer is separated to God for his special purpose and his special mission. You now have direct access to God. You have the opportunity to live your spiritual life with divine assets. Unlike the church, uh, the Israel of the Old Testament, they did not have a lot of the divine asset that we have now, but we do. We have the power of the spirit living in us forever. Every believer has the privacy. I love this one. Y'all open your ears. Every believer have the privacy 
to live his own spiritual life before God. In other words, the decision that you make each and every day of your life is between you and God. The Bible say, and, and uh, let's close with, with, let's go to Ephesians 6, verse 7 and 8. As a believer priest, everything that you do is from your own personal relationship with God. You don't need anyone to, to offer sacrifices to God or do anything for you. Uh, uh, Ephesians 6, verse 7 and 8. Anybody want to read, please? Okay, so here we see that every believer have the privacy to live his own spiritual life before the Lord. In other words, everything that we do for God, we do it for God. We don't do it for people. We don't do it to be seen, to be recognized, to be noticed, because everything you do, you do it as unto the Lord, knowing that whatever thing, each, whatever you do for the Lord, whatever service you offer to God as a believer uh, priest, you will be rewarded if you have the right motivation and why you did it. Every believer priest offers spiritual sacrifice to God on the altar of your soul. You know what we offer? See, right now, many of you are giving God your mind so that you may hear and learn his word and understand his word. See, that is an offering. As a believer priest, you are offering God your soul. Every time you take in God's word, you're saying, here is my soul. Feed my soul your word. Every time you come to church, you are offering uh, uh, God an offering as a believer priest. In Romans 12, 1 and 2 say, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living and holy sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Every time you use your body for holy purposes, you are offering your body unto the Lord as a believer priest. In other words, my hands and my feet, my heart, my emotion, my mind, my mouth, my eyes is for God's holy purpose. Every time I choose to refrain from sin or the influence of evil, then I am saying, God, here's an offering. And see, a lot of us as believer priests, we like to give God part of us and not all of us. Like these little children that always like to uh, 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 prevent me from grabbing all of their jelly beans. They always like to give me one in, in their dirty hands instead of uh, get, uh, let me pick my own. Uh, let me get what I want and not, not you try to give me what you want me to have. Uh, but a lot of believers like that. They like to give God uh, part of them rather than all of them. See, as a believer priest, we are called because of the grace and the mercy of God demonstrated at the cross. We are to give God our complete self. All of us say, Lord, every day you wake up, you say, Lord, here I am. Here's my complete self. Because that's what it say. I beseech you, brother, by the mercy of God, that you present your body. Now, it said body. It didn't say your arm, your leg, your feet, or just your ears and your eyes. It say your body. That means... God say, you owe me an offering. And that offering is your complete self, all of you. I want all of you for my holy purposes. And every time you choose to stay in fellowship with God, that's what you're doing. You're offering God your complete self. And what does fellowship with God mean? It means walking in obedience to the principles of the word of God. And the more you're obeying God's word, you are giving God an offering. You're saying, here I am as a result of what you've done for me. I give you my complete self every time you obey. And that's how you show your appreciation. And then lastly, in verse 2 of Romans 12, every time you do not allow the world to mold you to be like them, you're giving God an offering as a believer priest. And you represent yourself before God. And I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, I don't know about you, but I am uh, in control of my own personal spiritual life. You know, I'm, I'm not uh, just because 
I'm doing uh, certain things as a believer priest. I'm not asking you to do it. Uh, it's your choice uh, uh, to not allow the world to mold you to be like them in your response to the love of God. And so you are a believer priest. You represent yourself before God and you can come near to God in confession of your sin. You don't need to go to no priest. You can pray directly to God. You don't need nobody to pray for you. Uh, you can learn to apply God's word to your life to grow spiritually uh, because God have made it possible for you to understand his word. He gave you his spirit. Uh, uh, you can participate in the communion service today uh, because this is a priestly function only for believers in Jesus Christ. At this time, I want to ask the deacon uh, to come forward and uh, pass out the, the elements, uh, Glenn and, and Johnny. We can pass out the, uh, the, uh, the bread first. And may everyone um, hold on to the bread so that we all can take together. This bread that we're about to take represent the person of our Lord Jesus Christ taking on humanity uh, for our benefit. This ceremony is performed in memory of our Savior Jesus Christ, leaving the glories of heaven for our benefit. So to commemorate um, his love for us uh, and living a perfect life so that he can be the perfect sacrifice as a human, let us take together. Glenn, if you can give thanks for the bread. understand where we're at thank you so much for your mercies thank you for your life that we can have direct access to the Father through the moon 
At this time, we'll take the cup. May all obtain until we take together. This cup that we're about to take represent the spiritual death of Jesus Christ on the cross. The Bible said God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So in commemoration um, of the work of Christ and substitutionary spiritual death, let us take together. Brother Johnny, can you give thanks for the cup? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you show that you laid out of time. You pick something you couldn't fix to be worth it, and that abandon us to the Holy Spirit, demonstrate the mercy of the Lord. As Jesus is the King of the Son, that gave himself up to the Father, we thank you for your word that tells us all that we need to know about you, about ourselves, about what you've done for us. Amen. At this time, we will be dismissed. Thank y'all. Oh, one more song. One more song. All right, one more song.